This is the ninth video for the ethics and legal considerations portion of the animal chiropractic class. And in this video, we're going to start talking about malpractice claims. Now, the veterinarians are already familiar with malpractice claims involving veterinary care. And the chiropractors in the class are already familiar with malpractice claims involving human patients. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly and from a fairly basic level, just kind of as a reminder more than anything else. Now, the good news for the chiropractors is they're going to learn that the risk of being sued for veterinary malpractice is much lower than the risk from being sued for malpractice on human patients. And the primary reason for that is that the damages uh, if a human is injured, tend to be much higher than the damages if an animal is injured. Again, remember from earlier in the, the uh, uh, videos, animals are generally looked at as a piece of property. And because they're looked at as a piece of property, the damages, even if the mistake results in the animal's death, the damages are very limited. So because of that, because there's not much money to recover in these cases, most cases, uh, there's very little risk of being sued for uh, veterinary malpractice. But even though it's a small risk, it's a growing risk. And I think part of the reason it's growing is because of the treatment of uh, horses, the equine practice. Uh, because of the value of some of those horses that are being treated, uh, if a mistake is made, it is more likely to result uh, in a malpractice case where there's damages worth pursuing. Um, it's also, as you're working with larger animals, it's more likely that the humans involved, the client or associates of the client or the employees of the animal chiropractor might be injured. And when you're talking about a human injury, even though it's a veterinary practice, you still have the, the same kind of damages that would occur if an injured, if a human were injured from chiropractic malpractice. In a lot of these cases, the uh, uh, insurance trust for the AVMA reports that they spend as much on legal fees as the cost for paying claims for some of these species. Uh, which gives you a good idea if the uh, um, insurance company is spending that much money to defend these cases, there just isn't anything in it for the client or for the attorney representing the client. And because of that, it's not likely or less likely, I should say, that a malpractice case would be filed or that someone would be interested in filing a malpractice case. And then the last point on the slide, as I mentioned before, is there is a growing uh, group of claims for human injuries. So you want to be careful that humans are not injured in your practice. Uh, malpractice includes two basic types of claims. A negligence malpractice case is a traditional, what most people think of as a malpractice case. A breach of contract or a breach of warranty claim is something that can be avoided by the doctor if the doctor is careful about the promises they make to their clients. So it should never happen, but unfortunately it does happen. So the four elements of a, ne of a negligence cause of action, the doctor must owe a duty uh, to the client and the patient. The doctor must have breached that duty, did not provide care in accordance with the standard of care. And that breach must have caused, within a, a direct and foreseeable manner, must have caused the client or animal to suffer damages. In order to prove what the standard of care is and in order to prove that causation usually requires an expert witness. And the cost of an expert witness makes it even less likely that a malpractice claim would be pursued when there's a, a not much in the way of damages. Now, a breach of contract claim, on the other hand, can often be proven without an expert witness. So it's less expensive to pursue 
And if you open the door to make it possible for, for the client to sue you for a breach of contract, you're more likely to experience uh, uh, becoming involved in a malpractice case. Now, the elements of a claim for breach of contract are first that, that a valid contract or agreement existed, that the client performed or tendered their performance, offered to perform what they were supposed to do, that the doctor breached the contract, and that the client was damaged as a result of the breach. So, for example, if a doctor were to guarantee that the treatment they provided would uh, meet certain results, uh, for the uh, patient, uh, it's a fairly simple matter for the, the client to come in and prove that this was the agreement. Uh, and even though this was the agreement, in reality, what was delivered, the final result of the care, was not what the veterinarian or the chiropractor promised. So it's a much easier lawsuit to prove that the uh, doctor would be liable. So let's visit for a little bit about the uh, elements of a claim for negligence. Uh, the first element I mentioned is a duty. Uh, the doctor must owe a duty to the client and the patient. Once that duty is created, the doctor has a duty to act as a reasonable, prudent person. Uh, if they're a veterinarian, they must act as a reasonable, prudent veterinarian. Uh, if they're a chiropractic or an animal chiropractic veterinarian, they must act as a reasonable, prudent chiropractic veterinarian. And what does reasonably prudent mean? It means the degree of care and skill and knowledge and expertise that would be exercised by a typical person under like or similar circumstances. So if you took a average person a reasonable, prudent person and put them in the same situation, how would they act? Now, the duty becomes higher as you uh, reach higher levels of expertise. Uh, being required to act as a reasonable, prudent animal chiropractor, someone who's got training in both chiropractic and veterinary medicine, is going to be the highest standard in these situations. The uh, uh, Doctor-patient-client relationship can be created in two ways. Uh, the most common way is express acceptance. Both the doctor and the client agree that the doctor will provide care for the patient, and they express that, that acceptance. But it can also be created if the doctor exercises their independent professional judgment. Uh, doctors who uh, give advice over the telephone or make diagnoses over the telephone may create that doctor-patient, doctor-client-patient relationship. They can also do it in social situations. You know, I know that when I'm introduced and people find out that I'm an attorney, I almost immediately start getting questions about divorces and contracts and traffic tickets and all kinds of things legally related. And I'm sure when you get introduced as a veterinarian or as a chiropractor, you get a bunch of questions about your professional expertise as well. Once you start answering those questions, you're exercising your professional judgment, your independent professional judgment for the benefit of the client and the patient. You've created a doctor-patient relationship. So even though this person has never been in your office, the animal's never been in your office, you have no documentation, you have no examination, you can create that doctor-client-patient relationship. And that's a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, so be careful about how you answer questions. And generally, the safest answer is going to be, uh, uh, we can make an appointment and I can perform a complete examination at that time uh, and express, let you know what, what we can do for your animal uh, only then. Um, be careful about giving advice too carelessly. Also, be careful about social media. Uh, you know, I grew up in an age when we didn't have Facebook and LinkedIn and tweeting and Instagram and uh, uh, everything else that's out there. Uh, if you use that kind of social media, be sure that you are uh, not creating these doctor-patient-client relationships. 
if you express general advice, general information to uh, uh, the public at large, that's probably not going to create a doctor-patient, doctor-client-patient relationship. But on the other hand, if you give specific advice, uh, you know, a client asks about a specific situation with a specific animal, and you respond, well, that sounds like it could be, or this is the treatment I would recommend for that situation. Once you start giving away that professional judgment, you've created that relationship and you've created a duty to comply. Uh, also keep in mind that your staff can create a doctor-client-patient relationship. Uh, by the way, because they are acting on your behalf, if they give advice, again, over the telephone or in these social situations, your staff members can create a duty uh, for you to provide a, the care that a reasonable prudent veterinarian would provide. Um, so be careful about supervising and training your staff to minimize that risk. The second element of a negligence claim is a breach of that duty. Once the duty's been established, there is a doctor-client-patient relationship. Uh, the question is, did the doctor perform like a reasonable, prudent person? And the only way to prove that uh, standard of care is through the use of an expert witness. A layperson wouldn't know what animal chiropractors do, but another animal chiropractor could come in and testify and like I mentioned before, that makes these cases much more expensive to pursue. Uh, so it's less likely that an attorney would, would pursue this case. Uh, keep in mind the standard of care is likely to change, not likely. It will change over time. As the profession develops, as we learn more about animal chiropractic and what works and what doesn't work, uh, I expect we're going to see some changes to the standard of care. So it's important for the professionals to continue with continuing education so that they can be sure the care they provide meets the current standard of care. Also keep in mind that the standard of care for specialists like animal chiropractors is likely to be higher, not likely, it will be higher than the standard of care for a general practitioner. Uh, one example of a breach of duty would be a failure to diagnose. Uh, as a chiropractor working with animals, there is a, a real risk that you may not realize the animal has a condition that could be contagious or that the animal has a condition that could be dangerous to the animal. Uh, so it's a, if you observe anything out of the ordinary, if any of your examination results are not what you expect, or you have any suspicion the animal may have something more serious wrong with them, be certain you involve the veterinarian to make a, an appropriate diagnosis rather than you trying to make a, a, a brief diagnosis. Uh, another example of a breach of duty is failure to restrain the animal. Uh, especially working with larger animals, it is important that the animal be properly restrained. Uh, otherwise, the animal may injure themselves or may injure the people involved. Um, you should not use owner restraint if it's obvious that the animal is not under the owner's control. Uh, and there are situations where the owner says, don't worry about it, but you should worry about it. Make sure the animal's under proper control. If the client requests help, be sure you provide the help. And when you provide the help, I think it's also a good idea to get the client out of the way so that they're not likely or, or, or there's very low risk that they'll be injured by the animal. Uh, if you can tell by the client's uh, uh, body language or, or tone of voice that they're fearful, uncertain, inexperienced, or just don't have the knowledge to restrain the animals, uh, be sure again to get the client out of the way and get somebody properly trained in place to restrain the animal. You'll also see situations where the client just doesn't have the physical size or, or strength to control a larger animal. Uh, remember that when you're going to perform some of these chiropractic procedures, it may startle the animal or may cause pain or discomfort to the animal. 
And if it does, the animal's going to react. And the animal may, may react in a way that's going to injure the people around it unless the animal is properly restrained. So certainly one of the duties of an animal chiropractor is to restrain the animal appropriately. Now, I do expect as you go through this class and go through some of the labs, you'll get some further, more detailed instruction on the best ways to restrain animals. The third element of a negligence cause is proximate or negligence claim is proximate cause. Basically, the uh, damage suffered has to be foreseeable. It has to be predictable or reasonably predictable that the mistake made by the doctor would cause this kind of damage. And there has to be a direct causal relationship between the mistake and the damages. It can't be a protracted you know, the doctor caused X, which caused Y, which caused Z, which finally caused the damages. It has to be the doctor made a mistake and that caused the damages. Uh, so it has to be that kind of a close relationship. Again, this usually requires an expert witness to prove the uh, proximate cause, to prove that there is a causal relationship between the doctor's mistake and the damages that were suffered. And in the next video, we'll talk about damages and how they can be measured in these veterinary malpractice cases.